When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctors' offices that keep odd hours, the sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through said deserted roads with a vase of flowers in tow, I noticed an unkempt 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I'm left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by, so I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them they could safely drive ahead. They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind at a slow pace. Beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my base, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could, they hit the gas and again matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice, and I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot that I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other sign of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me into the partially under construction back portion of this lot, behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of rubble against my back, base and hand, and jumped from its peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped land within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after I reached the top of the rubble pile and was now nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter and panting in the student lounge among my classmates, who didn't seem to give a damn when I told them, possibly because our hometown is supposedly a human trafficking capital and the crime rate is outrageous, although I am convinced that this was something more informal than human trafficking, as the dilapidated car suggested poverty, and I have read human trafficking usually arises through grooming and not being snatched off the streets. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line of the local police station, but I was young, foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission form permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them, as I was entirely ignorant on the subject of cars and couldn't have identified the make of it had I been asked and I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited freedoms if they knew I had been in any danger. I feel horrible for having never told anyone and earnestly hope that my secrecy hasn't led to someone being hurt or killed. I believe the only missing people aside from runaway children or elderly adults with dementia in this city right now, though, are men, aside from one woman a few decades ago. Whoever followed and tried to trap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016, let's not meet. So I listened to these stories all the time and finally decided to share one of my many creepy stories. I live in a tough community with a high crime slash murder rate so I have seen a lot of crazy shit. Anyways, I used to take the train into the city for work and on a regular day I would park my car in the garage at the train station because this option was much quicker and saved me the wear and tear on my already struggling car. On this day my car was in the shop getting worked on so I had my girlfriend drop me off at the train station and asked my father to pick me up in the evening. Now my father is notorious for being late and despite my telling him I would be there 30 minutes before my train arrived when I got onto the platform and he was nowhere to be seen lol. 
I called him asking how long he would be and he gave me the typical grunt and responded, soon. I took a seat on a bench prepared to wait when I was approached by a man in a business suite. This was not an uncommon sight because many businessmen and women rode the train every day. He walked up to me and asked if he could sit for a moment. He had his phone in his hand and kept looking at it, putting it to his ear periodically, clearly checking if he could hear anything on the line. As he sits he looks at me and says, I hate these iPhones, never work when you need them to. I'll look back and just give him a nod and say, oh yeah I know. He tells me he just interviewed at his dream job in the city and the employer told him he would contact him with an answer around this time. He then asked if I could do him a favor and give his phone a call to make sure he had service and to be sure his phone was working properly. Really not thinking anything of it I agreed and handed him my phone. I'm not afraid of him running away with it because while he is a grown man, I'm not little and am confident I would beat the shit out of this guy lol. He dials away and without hesitation his phone rings and a thought pops into my head. That sneaky son of a bitch, he just wanted my number. I should explain why I immediately thought of this, long story slash encounter short I apparently have some look gay men are attracted to. I have been approached on multiple occasions and I have asked if by looking at me if they think I am gay. Most say no but they feel comfortable trying. A compliment at its core but happens more than I am comfortable with. As this guy in the suit is pretending to be relieved his phone works I am not angry at him. I thought it was a little clever and shrugged it off as you got me. He gives me my phone back and I open it up pretending to look at something important hoping he would go away, he didn't. He just sat there watching me, I was getting uncomfortable and when I am put in a situation my general response is impulsive and I want to fight. I'm not homophobic or anything but he was like 3 inches away from me and just looking at me. I could feel my blood pumping, I started to repeat to myself, keep it up, I'm going to bite your face off lol. I have a much bigger bark than bite but can confidently say if you get on my wrong side, I will swing at you. I look at him and ask if there was anything else he needed and the fucking creep didn't flinch, just sat there looking at me with a stupid grin on his face. I think he knew I was onto him and he thought it was funny, it wasn't. To my amazement before I told this guy to fuck off my father pulls up and I quickly get to my feet and walk towards the car not acknowledging him or looking back. My father makes a joke when I get into the car asking if that was my boyfriend because of the way he was looking at me. I laugh and say no, not a chance I was going to tell my father what the creep was up to. I did this for the creep's sake, my father is a very hard man, in prison, been shot, has found God and is a wonderful man now but not the man you want to piss off, especially when it comes to his kids. Later that night I was writing a paper for college when my phone rang. I don't recognize the number but it only takes me a sec to realize it's that guy. I answer. Hello. Hi, I missed a call by this number. Sorry man I don't know, must have the wrong number. Are you sure? I feel like I recognize your voice, I think we know each other. Nope, I don't know you and don't recognize your voice. You have the wrong number. I'm telling you I think I know you, where do you live maybe we're neighbors. Okay guy, I know who this is and didn't want to be me. I know what you're doing but I am not interested. Please don't call again. Satisfied I did not lose my cool I went back to my paper and initially forgot about the call. About 10 minutes after the call I got a text message saying something about how he will take care of me. Still in my, I'm not going to lose it mode I just laugh and block the number. Fast forward at least a few months. I'm with a friend getting a coffee and my phone goes off. Say I have a voicemail and I still don't know how I got it without my phone ringing. When I listened to the voicemail recorded something like, Hello Chris, this is Dr. Smith. I want to confirm our appointment tomorrow and let you know we have changed offices. My secretary is on vacation so if there is no response just be aware your appointment has been moved to tomorrow and our new office is located. I listened to the voicemail and thought, should I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow? However professional the voicemail sounded I didn't feel right about it. For one I had no clue who Dr. Smith was and I didn't remember making any appointments. I was really trying to figure it out, I was even going as far as thinking my insurance requires a yearly physical or something. I listened to the voicemail a few more times and on the third or fourth time it hit me. I don't know how but I recognized his voice, the man from the train station. I told my friend and he suggested we drive by the address he listed. When we arrived we were at these old mill buildings. The area I live in is historic for its mills during the industrial revolution and recently there have been a lot of construction renovating them into offices and apartments so nothing stood out yet. Parked outside I needed to see the fifth floor like the voicemail said. 
we didn't need to go all the way up to the fifth to see that this building was completely empty. I was surprised we could walk in. No bells rang when looking at the rustic exterior of the building because even the finished mills had preserved that old look on the outside. However on the inside this place is deserted and falling apart. You can tell homeless people stay here because there were a few dirty mattresses and other signs people have been there. My friend and I looked at each other and both let out a small wail and ran out of there half scared half laughing. However when we got back to the car I was not laughing anymore. I was pissed and to this day I wish I reacted more responsibly. I should have called the police and tried to set him up but instead I called him back and when he answered I immediately told him to drop the act. I told him I wasn't going to call the cops but when or if I ever saw him I would murder him. I was screaming into the phone telling him all the horrible ways I would take his life if he kept it up. I never heard from him again but I can honestly admit after my anger went away I considered the full scope of what he had planned and it shook me up for days. What on earth had he had planned? What would he have done to me? Rape? Murder? Sorry if this is long, I would love some opinions. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship, so I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone and so on. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing. I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim was not very happy, though. Tim's training to become a doctor. He's a very smart guy, and my friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim said. I agreed, and Tim and I talked it over for a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with Joe, Tim said, when I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up again, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of himself that was less friendly, as well. He had very low self-esteem, and was always looking for reassurance. At first that wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly. He seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts. Occasionally that gets me, or someone else in our friend group, into trouble. Mary's cute, and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions but because she has no instincts she can't sense danger, and sometimes drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date, and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him again, so I invited Joe to an event my hobby club was holding. I figured that was safe, because we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was alright. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. After the event, we walked along the river for a bit, on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We parted ways at a busy train station. I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything would be alright. Then, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me, and told me he was going to commit suicide. I freaked out, and tried to calm him down. I stayed up all night talking to him, from when he called around 10pm until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up he would kill himself, so I stayed on the line, talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't leave anyone to commit suicide. As I sat on my patio, watching the sun rise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook. He said, thank you, and for a moment I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I just saved a life. Then, Joe said, with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life, and hung up. I was stunned. What the hell? Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day it was going to be busy for me, just to get off on the attention? I decided there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again. I told Mary what had happened, and she was very apologetic. She agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, 
and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would. Joe didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was, when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to kill himself again, so I messaged Mary, and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on Joe for a few days. Not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 a.m. The caller never said anything, just breathed heavily down the line. It was so unnerving. I blocked the number every time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private number to get around caller ID. I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family has private numbers, because one of them was scammed a while back. Luckily the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money, but unfortunately for me that meant that if I received a call from a private number at night I had to pick it up, just in case something had happened to a member of my family. On one particular night, my phone went off at 3 a.m. It was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe. I was staring at my phone, trying to work out what to do. I never let the calls go to voicemail because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was. I was afraid that if I didn't play along, he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing. I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, then paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half awake, and answer it with a slightly croaky voice. I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother, John. I realized that I could use that. I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could, then said, hello. I was delighted with the result. I sounded exactly like John. It was uncanny. It made me a little sad, really. John died about a year before I met Joe. It was a bit of a jolt, hearing something so close to his voice again after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it could ring out, trapped the answer button, then said that deep hello again. This time there was no creepy heavy breathing, only silence. I said another deep hello. After a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time, I'd have to hang up on him. No matter what I said before, he had always wanted as much of my time as he could get. I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now, and it looks like I'm free of Joe. I haven't gotten any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number, or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said, hello, he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. I will probably spend my life looking over my shoulder. Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. Every time a beat up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or the train station, I worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me. He's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that. The friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related, actually, so he believes what she tells him. When I'm done with my studies, I'm going to move across the country. Until then, I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30-minute train ride apart. That's nowhere near far enough away, but it will have to do. There is one positive thing that has come out of this. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. Oh, and Joe, let's never meet again. When I was 10, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. 
my cousin also came to visit and we decided we wanted to go to the YMCA for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in four hours. On that day the YMCA was empty, there were a couple of adults in the exercise room but that's it. We went to the basketball court and after two hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we were bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming but, this YMCA had a pretty cool pool so we changed into our bathing suits and headed in there. The pool was empty except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games and swam laps but after about an hour, there wasn't much left to do and there was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting. So, we decided to play a game of seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we just stuck our heads face down in the water. We did this a couple of times and I was winning. On our last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me that I won. But instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in the pool we figured we would get out, get dressed, and go back to the basketball court until my grandmother picked us up. We only had an hour left anyways and the water was freezing. As we got out the lifeguard stopped us and asked if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course, we were super excited that she allowed us to do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside, above the door, there was a clock, probably to help make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna but if you looked out the door you could clearly see it. She followed us in and went over to the thermometer encased in plastic and unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured that she must have to turn it on each time so I didn't think anything of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls and so we couldn't see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob but I knew she was turning up the heat. Then she left and shut the door behind her. I thought I saw her lock the door too, but I thought to myself. Why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should get out in 10 or 15 minutes. It was already plenty warm in the sauna but now the room was blazing. It felt nice because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes it was starting to get a little bit too hot and my cousin agreed that we should leave so we could get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door but it wasn't budging. I thought maybe it was jammed so I shook it but it still wasn't opening and then I let my cousin try. She couldn't get it open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes so we sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter now too and I really wanted to leave. I got up and started banging on the door and shaking slash twisting the knob trying to get the lifeguard's attention. My cousin got up and joined me. We started screaming at the top of our lungs for her to let us out but she just stared straight ahead. I don't think there's any way that she couldn't have noticed or heard two little girls banging and kicking the door and screaming. Now we had been in there for about 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna that it hurt to breathe, it felt like my lungs were on fire. My eyes and skin were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads because they were still a little damp and it made it easier to breathe. I was so worried about my cousin as she is a couple of years younger than me. I looked at the clock and saw that we had been there for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again and saw the lifeguard still just staring straight ahead. Again. I tried to get her attention by screaming that we needed out and banging on the door as hard as I could, but still nothing. I was starting to get pretty dizzy so I went to sit back down but the wooden seats of the sauna burned my skin. My towel was completely dry so I put it underneath me to sit on. My hair was also dry but I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and I squinted my eyes so that they didn't burn as badly but I could still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped a little bit. My cousin was laying face down with the towel over her head not moving or saying anything so I nudged her to make sure that she was still okay. She was, but I could tell that we really needed to get out of there soon because she seemed a bit disoriented. It had been 45 minutes now and I was extremely nauseous. There was no way that the lifeguard would forget that we were in there and I thought she would have to come back soon but there was this little voice in my head telling me that maybe she purposely locked us in there. Finally, a man walked past the door towards the pool but for some reason, I just couldn't get up. My whole body was on fire and I felt so dizzy. Luckily this man wasn't going to the pool, he wanted to be led into the sauna and came back with the lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now that for sure she had locked us in there because she pulled out her keys to unlock the door and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer so as the man was trying to walk in, 
I was trying to shove our way out. As we were going out the lifeguards started trying to shut the door and push us back with it. The man was clearly confused about what was going on and said, um I think they went out. The lifeguard let out a sigh and opened the door fully and we ran away as fast as we could into the changing room. We only had about 10 minutes before our grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what just happened. They thought that I must have been exaggerating and they didn't believe me. I truly think that that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt that I have is what would have happened if we actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. What was her endgame? I'm 21 now but I think about this interaction all the time and when I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one believes this story, and I get it. It's pretty absurd. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions but do you think that this could have been some crazy misunderstanding or do you think that she really just left us there to die? And why? So, to the lifeguard at that YMCA please let's not meet again. I've never posted before so forgive me. This happened when I was 13 and in Egypt on a family holiday. I'm blonde and short so stuck out like a sore thumb and received a lot of unwanted creepy attention. My little brother is also blonde and we were traveling with our mom so a lone female with two little blonde kids was unseen back then. Anyway, daily I was touched and photographed and my mom was even offered money to buy me but this was all taken in my stride as I understood I was like an alien to them. I noticed however this one cleaner in our hotel was always around us. Always watching. One afternoon I ran up to the hotel room with my little brother to grab a float for the pool and while we were in the room there was a knock on the door. I had a peek through the spy hole and saw the male cleaner. He shouted, clean towels, but I could clearly see his hands were empty and there was no card beside him. I shouted back, no thanks, and thought this would be the end of it. No. He shouted again, towels opened the door, but I obviously didn't and just ignored him this time. Then he tried the door. I panicked and adrenaline kicked in. I shut my little brother in the toilet and told him to lock the door. Looking back now I don't know why I didn't get in the bathroom too. I wish I did. I pushed the chair I was using to spy against the door and went to the balcony to look over for my mom at the pool. The next thing I knew he was in the room. He didn't have any towels. He said he wanted to show me how to make swans from the towels I had. I again said no thanks. He insisted and grabbed a towel from the bed, already in a swan shape, and unraveled it. He stood behind me so my back was to his front and put the middle of the towel edge in my mouth. He started to pull the edges of the towel inwards pulling me into him every time. I realized now what he was really doing. He twisted it and twisted it with such force I was being jolted backwards and forwards. I was terrified and could feel the tears in my eyes. Then my mom came into the room wondering why we were taking so long. She saw the man standing with me and demanded he leave. She stormed down to customer relations and went mental at the staff but from recent conversations about it I've learned nothing happened to the man and my mom was told it's how men are sometimes. We were petrified to go anywhere the rest of the holiday and stayed away from the hotel as much as possible after this. My mom also learned not to tell anyone when she's traveling alone and never let us go to the room by ourselves. When I was about 8 to 9 my family took a trip skiing to a small resort a couple of hours from where we lived in Spain. The resort itself was a sleepy little town of about 400 to 500 people max, with a few small supermarkets and hotels, and not much else. Typically, we picked the worst time possible to embark on the trip, which we had been planning for a good few years. The night after we arrived there was a blizzard, and so we spent the first half of the week locked in the hotel. Although we were able to go outside for the remaining few days, we had little to do given that the slopes were shut. The story I want to tell comes from those first few days locked in the hotel. Despite my parents' annoyance at the timing of the trip being a nightmare, myself and my sister, who was 11 months older, were having a fantastic time. Locked up in the mountains with nothing to do, we were able to spend our days running around the hotel, eating sweets and watching the TV in the lobby. I should probably mention at this point that the hotel was somewhat of a maze. The large bar slash restaurant area where my parents sat each day reading was at the center of the hotel. A myriad of smaller rooms then connected to the bar area at random points, shooting off in different directions. These rooms often had no discernible function, each one had the same mahogany interior, and they were full of couches, 
fireplaces and antiques that allowed for great games of hide and seek. The rooms would often have offshoots themselves, connecting to new rooms which would then connect to yet more useless wooden caves. As such, it was possible to be four or five rooms away from the main hotel area at any one time, without knowing exactly where you were or how to get back. Anyway, at some point along the weekend myself and my sister decided to play hide and seek. Bearing in mind the above, it was almost an impossible challenge to find the hider, especially if they moved, to this day I'm certain my sister was a filthy little cheat. At one point in the game I was just about to give up on searching for my sister until I heard her voice from what sounded like a few rooms away. After successfully navigating the web of rooms, I emerged to find her sitting on a couch alongside a German man with grey hair, probably in his 60s if I had to guess. As soon as I emerged into the room the man turned to me and told me he was taking my sister to the swimming pool, and asked if I wanted to come. I remember immediately thinking it odd that there was a swimming pool that we hadn't heard of. My parents had been complaining that morning about how much TV we were watching and so I was sure they would have taken us there had they known about it, and besides, the hotel did not seem of the size to be able to host one. I told the man that I'd have to ask my parents first, and told my sister to come back with me to find them. He immediately replied that I should go and that he'd take my sister on ahead. I told my sister that she absolutely had to come with me, but excited at the thought of the swimming pool she said she didn't want to. We began to argue, with the man taking my sister's side and encouraging me to go ask my parents permission whilst he waited with my sister. I dug my foot in, telling my sister that our parents would be very cross if we went somewhere on our own, and after a few minutes of bickering she eventually gave in and came back with me giving her assurance to the man that we'd come back. Of course when we told our parents they were living, my dad went back to the room to try and find the man, but with all the offshoots and given that all the random rooms looked the same, it was almost impossible to be sure that we were in the right one. In any case, there was no sign of him. I remember my dad screaming at the hotel lobby that he needed a list of all male guests and their room numbers, but of course they wouldn't give it to him. We spent the rest of the trip by our parents' side, terrified of the thought of being locked up in a blizzard with him. Thankfully, we never saw the man again. The scary thing? We checked with the lobby, and as we'd imagined, the hotel did not have a pool. So scary German man who wanted to abduct me in a blizzard, let's not meet again. In 1988, 22-year-old Lisa Leanne Atkins was busy raising her 13-month-old son, Scott, in Tucson, where they lived. Lisa was known to be light-hearted and fun-loving, and she absolutely loved animals so much so that she sought out employment at a local pet store, Village Pet Market, on Orange Grove Road. Lisa was fortunate to have her own mother close by, who would help out with watching the baby when Lisa needed to go to work. Things were going well for the family around this time, but Lisa's mother, Martha, noted that Lisa's fun-loving demeanor was beginning to change leading up to Easter of 1988, she claims that Lisa began to withdraw and distance herself from her loved ones. Martha believes that Lisa had a feeling, or a premonition, of what was to come, saying, I believe she thought she was going to die because she kind of distanced herself a little bit. Last few months, she was a little less close. The murder. On April 4th, Lisa went to work at Village Pet Mart for her scheduled shift working with another employee at the shop. During the middle of her shift, Lisa decided to phone her mother to check in on Scott, to see how he was behaving for her. The two spoke for a while, with Martha mentioning that she had just put the baby down for a nap, and he was sleeping peacefully. Martha and Lisa agreed that they would meet up once Lisa's shift was over, in order to go and cash Martha's IRS check, before they hung up the phone. Returning back to the cash register, Lisa was chatting with her co-worker when an unknown man walked into the store. The man, wearing a hoodie, walked directly up to them and proceeded to pull out a gun, demanding all the money in the cash register. Frightened, Lisa's co-worker fumbled with the keys before dropping them, and as soon as he bent down to pick them up off the floor, the man shot Lisa in the head. The man then fled the store with the day's receipts. This man was described as white, with a beard and sandy blonde or brown hair. He stands about 5 feet 11 inches, weighing roughly 170 pounds, and between the ages of 25 to 30. He was believed to be driving an older model, green pickup truck, 
with either a white camper shell or wooden side panels. During the time of the murder, Martha was lying down, taking a nap with Scott. Lisa's younger sister, Katrina, was outside the home riding her new bike when she had overheard that something had happened at the shopping plaza where Lisa worked. Katrina became concerned and quickly rode her bike over to Village Pet Market, only to be met by squad cars and police officers. The officers didn't allow Katrina to enter the pet shop, but instead the district attorney's office and victim's witness officials escorted her back home. Martha stated that as soon as she opened the door to find Katrina and the police there, she knew that Lisa was dead. Closing Scott was raised by his grandmother Martha and grandfather David, alongside his aunt, Katrina. Martha described how difficult it was to explain to Scott what happened to his mother, as he grew older. She recalled many moments where Scott would ask about his mother, and if they ever caught the man responsible for her death, and every time he asked, she would have to tell him no, not yet. But they were still hopeful. Thirty-four years have since passed, making Scott thirty-five. Now, he is married and raising his own two children. Martha spoke about how difficult each year is that passes, saying, It's been so long it's almost like the memories are gone, I'm afraid. But, Martha keeps the memories that remain close to her heart, the memories of Lisa's love of crocheting, animals, arts and crafts. She thinks fondly back on the memory of gifting Lisa a kiln for her 16th birthday, in order to foster her love of ceramics and her creative spirit. And mostly, the love that Lisa had for her son, and the love that Martha has and always will have for her daughter. 28-year-old Franklin Motdon Jr. was a bank teller at Valley National Bank in Tucson, Arizona, where he lived, in 1957. He originally hailed from New Jersey, where he was born into a prominent, wealthy family, but moved west when he was six years old. He spent time in New Mexico, before making his way to Tombstone, Arizona, and then Tucson. Those around him described him as a kind man with a dry sense of humor, who was shy around women. A prior friend noted that despite coming from a wealthy family, Franklin was very proud of his modest living in Arizona, making his own path in life and living it to the fullest. She considered him to be idealistic, describing him as, like a teen, where the stardust hadn't yet been knocked out of his eyes. On the weekend of May 3-5, 1957, Franklin's friends, the Whitesides, were planning on going away for a short trip to visit family. They had decided to invite Franklin to stay at their home for the weekend, located on West Anklam Road, near Gates Pass, while they were away. Franklin agreed, and spent two nights in the Whitesides' home, before they returned around 5 p.m. on Sunday, May 5th. Upon their return, they spent roughly two hours chatting with Franklin, before he decided it was time to head back to his own home, and got into his Studebaker and drove away. This was the last verifiable sighting of Franklin before he was murdered. On May 6, when Franklin didn't show up for work at his branch in downtown Tucson, his supervisor phoned John Whiteside, who was not only Franklin's friend, but also the head of the bank's university branch. The supervisor requested that John make the short drive over to Franklin's home to check on him and make sure everything was all right. John agreed and arrived at Franklin's apartment around 8.45 a.m., where he found the door closed but unlocked. When he knocked and didn't receive an answer, John opened the door and entered the apartment, calling Franklin's name. Again, receiving no reply, John proceeded through the apartment, where he discovered a startling scene in the bedroom. Entering Franklin's bedroom, John discovered Franklin lying face down on the bed, with his wrists tied to the posts of the bed with a heavy nylon cord. The cord also extended up to his neck, where it was looped around and tied underneath his chin. Dried blood was caked on Franklin's right ear and side of his head and it was obvious that he was no longer alive. Panicked, John proceeded out the front door and knocked on the landlady's door, which was adjoined to Franklin's apartment, in order to notify someone when he received no answer. John drove back to the bank headquarters where they called the police. When police arrived on scene, they noted it didn't appear that a struggle had taken place. All the lights in the apartment had been left on, and the TV set was still playing, however, the back door was left ajar about three inches. The cord that bound Franklin's hands to the bed was 68 feet long, curled up on the foot of the bed, and Franklin's shirt and pants were tossed on a chair next to it. Franklin was wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and near his head laid a green bath towel, with a blackened hole in the middle of it. The t-shirt he was wearing, along with the shirt tossed on the chair, both had smeared lipstick stains on them. The lipstick marks were a point of interest to investigators, 
as Franklin was known to not often socialize with women in a romantic sense. The bullet that had killed Franklin was discovered underneath his body, lodged deep into the mattress, but the murder weapon itself was missing. Officers searched for fingerprints inside the apartment, but came up empty-handed with results. They did note that Franklin's keys, wallet, and watch were missing from the home, but despite this, officers felt this was a crime of passion, rather than a robbery. An autopsy was performed on the body, which showed that the bullet entered Franklin's right ear, and exited his skull about two inches above his left ear. They determined that the murder weapon would have been a 4 9 mm pistol. They also took tissue samples to test, which concluded that Franklin did not have any alcohol in his system, but strangely, they did find chloral hydrate, used to render him unconscious. There were no marks, scratches, or bruises anywhere on Franklin's body, leading them to believe he may not have fought back. Testing of his stomach proved that Franklin had eaten a meal about two hours before he died, with an examiner stating that he had about half a pint of food in his stomach, not yet digested. This would become a topic of discussion, as Franklin did not eat dinner with the Whitesides, and it was unsure where he may have stopped to dine. There was no evidence that Franklin had eaten inside his apartment that evening. Investigators wanted to look closer at the evidence, starting with the cord that bound Franklin's hands. They learned that it was manufactured in Los Angeles. One of the lead detectives made a trip to L.A., visiting the headquarters of the manufacturer, and tried to determine if any of Franklin's acquaintances may have bought such a lengthy piece of rope. This lead also left police empty-handed. Investigators spoke to witnesses and others living in the apartment complex, which provided them with new details. One woman said that she heard a loud noise coming from the apartment between 9.55 to 10.30 that Sunday night, which police believed to have been the fatal gunshot. Police quickly came to a standstill in the investigation, not even a year after the murder. With no known motive, they were unable to gain any traction in the case. Rumors circulated with officers taking on a wild goose chase in order to find an unidentified man who apparently had visited Franklin's apartment a week prior. Who this man was, and why he visited Franklin, is still unknown. They contemplated the lipstick stains on Franklin's shirts, wondering if this was a rendezvous gone wrong, a crime of passion. To this day, the case is still unsolved, and seemingly forgotten by most. Franklin never received the justice he deserved, and most of his friends and family have since passed without answers as to who killed him that late spring evening in 1957. In 2018, Franklin's niece, Lori, came across a letter that her grandmother had written about Franklin's murder, and when she read it, she made it her mission to get the case solved. She spoke to police and opened a FOIA request, where they then told her the files were long gone. However, a while later, a detective contacted Lori and told her that they had in fact found two boxes of files in the cold case storage room. This prompted the police to reopen the case, with them even going as far as executing a search warrant on the home of two original suspects, though names aren't listed. This did not lead to anything substantial, but it did prompt the police to continue looking into the murder of Franklin Doan Jr. A package lands on the doorstep having just been delivered by the postman. It is wrapped in brown paper and addressed to the owner of the house in handwritten block lettering. Thinking nothing of it, the recipient grabs the package and hastily opens it. A book lies inside. It feels strangely light, but there is nothing immediately untoward about the event. But when the cover is flipped open, that quickly changes. The book has been hollowed out, its pages replaced with an improvised explosive rig to detonate once the cover is open. Three rifle cartridges are fired outwards in a cloud of gunpowder and smoke that shred anything in their path. In 1982, Joan Kipp received such a package, which sadly took her life. The event seemed isolated for a time until, 11 years later, other explosive packages began falling through letterboxes across New York. Over the subsequent years, five bombs were sent through the mailing service by the so-called Zip Gun Bomber. There is no known motive, no communication, and the case hits a standstill. Suspects emerge, but there is no concrete evidence linking them to the spree. Now, 26 years after the final bomb was delivered, the identity of the elusive zip gun bomber still remains a mystery. Joan Kipp's life and career. At the time of her death in May 1982, Joan Kipp was 54 years old. She spent most of her life living in Brooklyn, New York, where she also met her eventual husband, Howard. The two subsequently got married and had two children, a daughter named Doreen, and a son named Craig. Doreen was in her 30s at the time of her mother's death and lived in Connecticut, 
whilst Craig was several years younger and still lived near his parents in the Bay Ridge area. Both were married and had their own respective families. Howard Kipp also owned a marine consulting business of which Craig was an employee for a time. From the outside, life appeared to be both prosperous and contented for the Kipps. Outside of the family, Joan worked as a guidance counselor at a local high school a position she had occupied for 15 years. She was responsible for the oversight of counseling programs within the Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, and Borough Park areas. She also worked as the treasurer of the Bay Ridge Community Council with ambitions to run for the vice president position a role she was widely expected to fill after an election period. But when she returned home after a busy day of work in May 1982 and found a package lying on the doorstep, Bell's ambitions came to a tragic and untimely end. The first package. On Friday, May 7, 1982, Joan Kipp returned home to her residence in Brooklyn. Mother's Day was around the corner, and she was planning to leave the state later that evening for a weekend away in Connecticut with her husband, Howard. After arriving home, she promptly checked the mail and found that a package had been delivered with her name on the address label. As she began tearing off the brown wrapping paper, Howard returned home and greeted his wife. Beneath the paper was a cookbook, specifically a Sears title named The Quick and Delicious Gourmet Cookbook. Believing it to be an early Mother's Day gift, Joan opened the cover expecting to see colorful depictions of what could be their next dinner offering. Instead, the pages had been removed and replaced with an improvised explosive. It instantly detonated, sending three bullets outwards in Joan's direction. Two hit her in the abdomen and the third became embedded in a nearby wall. The explosion also caused burns to Joan's chest and hands and she fell to the floor amidst the smoke and carnage. Upon hearing the calamity, Howard rushed to Joan's side to find her bleeding and in shock. He called for an ambulance and later recalled how, as the pair were waiting for medical assistance, Joan spoke to him, saying, look at what they did to me. There may be others. Joan was rushed to the nearby Lutheran hospital and entered surgery at approximately 7.45 p.m. that evening. Sadly, however, her injuries were too extensive and she passed away kick-starting the investigation into her death. The police investigation and analysis of the bomb. After launching an investigation into Joan Kipp's murder, detectives quickly focused on the design of the explosive itself. A six-volt battery had been wired to several metal tubes that contained explosive gunpowder and .22 caliber rifle shells. When the cover was opened, the battery was activated, sending an electrical current into the makeshift gun barrel and releasing the shells. The bullets were fired upwards at an angle corresponding to where the victim's chest would be. The device had clearly been manufactured with the intent of maximizing the prospect of physical injury. The design was relatively simplistic and the parts needed were not difficult to obtain, but the maker still required knowledge of electrical wiring in order to fashion the device. Additionally, detectives found that the package had been mailed out of Staten Island and had traveled through the postal service before arriving at the Kip household around noon on the day Joan was killed. Remnants of a note were also found amongst the bomb shrapnel, which when reassembled read, Dear Joan, you're dead, note, some sources also say fragments of the book contained a warning that Howard and the two children would be targeted next. Had the bomb been a terrible prank that had gone awry? Detectives considered the prospect, believing that Joan herself may have believed such a notion. As she lay dying, she reportedly told her husband Howard to contact local school officials as other bombs may have been sent. Regardless of the motive, no other bombs were discovered nearby and the investigation began to grow difficult for detectives. Despite their lack of leads, detectives continued their investigation. Their focus gradually began to concentrate on Joan's immediate family, namely her husband and their two children. Howard later recalled how he fully complied with their requests. He provided them with Joan's personal diary and a key to his shop so officers could look for evidence. He did not ask for a search warrant. Doreen was also brought in for questioning on the same day as her mother's funeral. It is because of this timing that she reportedly grew combative towards the investigation, urging her father and brother to do the same. Detectives could not locate any evidence to link either Howard or Doreen to Joan's murder. However, their focus narrowed on Craig Kipp, and he eventually became their prime suspect. Craig Kipp was 28 at the time of his mother's death and lived just a few blocks away from his parents in Brooklyn. He had also spent some time working in his father's business, where he worked on boats and ships and had experience with electrical wiring. However, he was eventually dismissed from this position, and detectives believed this may have caused him to become resentful of his parents. As such, he became their primary focus. With the suspect now in mind, 
detectives began attempts to connect Craig Kipp to his mother's murder. A scent tracking dog alerted to Craig's scent on the packaging the bomb had been sent in, although this was not considered damning in the absence of other, more concrete, evidence. Also, a handwriting analyst suggested that the writing on the note found with the bomb was similar to Craig's. It should be noted, however, that subsequent analyses conducted over a year later came to an alternate conclusion, that the handwriting was not similar, and that analyzing block lettering is exceptionally difficult. This finding, therefore, is contentious. Finally, when officers requested Craig Kipp take a polygraph test, he declined, which of course was his right to do. After several weeks of investigation, detectives felt confident in Craig's guilt and he was arrested on August 9th, having been charged with mailing injurious articles a charge with a possible life sentence attached in the event of a guilty verdict. Had the police found the man they had been searching for after all? Craig Kipp's arrest caused significant unrest within his family. Prosecutors at Craig's trial stated that they believed Craig and his mother had a turbulent relationship full of hatred and bitterness. Howard Kipp, however, disputed these claims, stating that the pair occasionally had arguments but nothing unusual. Additionally, Howard claimed that Craig's dismissal from the marine business was amicable and that his son had only been fired because he was unsuited for the position and struggled with the electrical engineering work required. The prosecutors also claimed that Craig may have had a drug problem that could have explained his actions. Both Howard and Doreen, however, also disputed these claims. Craig sometimes smoked weed, they said, but he did not have a dependency problem. In the absence of any solid evidentiary links between Craig Kipp and the bomb that killed his mother, the charges against him were ultimately dropped in June 1983 and he was released from custody. The identity of Joan Kipp's killer remained unknown. With no further evidence or suspects, Joan Kipp's murder case began to grow cold. No further bombs were found in the subsequent years, leading many to believe the brutal slaying had been an unfortunate isolated incident. Both Craig and Doreen Kipp returned to their families, and Howard Kipp left the house he shared with his wife and moved to Massachusetts, where he later remarried. The two children would also move out of state in the preceding years. The family held hope that Joan's murderer would be found, resolute in their belief that nobody in the family was responsible, but the years went by with no explanation for what happened that fateful day. Eleven years passed with no further incidents. But then, in October 1993, the Zip Gun Bomber made their return. The bomber returns eleven years later. On October 15, 1993, 68-year-old retired sanitation worker Anthony Lenza went on holiday to Pennsylvania with his wife, Connie. The pair were joined in Pennsylvania by their various children and grandchildren, who had also collected their mail from back home and brought it to them. Amongst the letters and bills was a curious package enveloped in brown paper. The package was addressed to Anthony Lenza and so he began tearing off the paper. There was a blue velvet coin box inside, which he later recalled opening upside down. It is perhaps this fact that ultimately saved his life the coin box had been filled with an explosive that detonated and fired three bullets outwards. Both Anthony and his wife were hit with the projectiles, as was their 11-year-old granddaughter, Liza. Their injuries, thankfully, were treatable. Investigators examined the explosive device and found a similar mechanism, a pair of six-volt batteries wired to metal pipes that had been taken from brake lines and used to form a crude gun barrel device. When the cover was opened, it triggered a ballpoint pen spring that had been fashioned into a detonator. Also, the address on the label had been written in a similar way to the one used in Joan Kipp's murder. The similarity between the devices was noted but investigators could find no connection between the two families to explain why they had been targeted and why such an extensive period of time had elapsed between the first and second bombs being delivered. Several months passed before the zip gun bomber sent another horrific package. On April 5, 1994, 75-year-old Alice Caswell lived in her small home in Brooklyn A home she once shared with her husband Norman, who sadly died six years beforehand. At approximately 1.20 p.m. that afternoon, Alice received a package that had been delivered by her usual postman, Richard. The box, however, was not addressed to her. Instead, it had been sent to Richard McGarrow, her brother. He was a retired customs agent who had worked at Newark Airport and had briefly lived with Alice before moving into a retirement facility. He had left over a decade ago but Alice still occasionally received her brother's mail and brought it to him at the facility. On this day, Alice decided to open her brother's mail as she regularly did before taking it to him. When she did, the package exploded in her hands, sending shrapnel soaring into her abdomen. 
In a daze, she made her way outside into a neighbor's house where an ambulance was hastily called. She was rushed to the hospital in a critical state but she thankfully survived after medical intervention. Alice Caswell was the only victim of the zip gun bomber who opened a package not directly addressed to her. At this time, the media also latched onto the case and dubbed the culprit the zip gun bomber. Only weeks passed by before the next package was delivered. In April 1994, Harold Ormsby discovered a curious package laying on the doorstep that had been addressed to him. At the time, however, he had been carefully following recent news stories about the bombings, as well as another spate of attacks that had been occurring in upstate New York. His caution led to him refusing to open the package and forbidding anyone else in the family to do so. The police took custody of the box and confirmed that it was indeed an explosive device. Nothing else was declared about the event, however, perhaps in an effort to make the details private and prevent false confessions. Thankfully Harold Ormsby's caution saved his life that day. The next bomb was delivered over 12 months later. On June 27, 1995, Stephanie Gaffney was eight months pregnant and living at her grandparents' home in the Queens area of New York. Whilst she was talking on the phone, she discovered a package that had been delivered in the mail. It was addressed to Gilmore or Occupant, which was her grandfather's surname, who previously worked as a police officer, as well as her uncle's surname, who actively worked in the NYPD. Stephanie opened the package and found a book. Its pages had been removed and replaced with an explosive device that detonated when she opened the cover. Stephanie was rushed to the hospital with burns to her abdomen, chest, and legs, but both she and the baby survived, although doctors had to induce labor the following day. Stephanie Gaffney credits her survival to the fact she opened the book at an angle and faced in another direction, meaning she avoided the bullets entirely. One year later, the zip gun bomber's final package was sent. On June 20, 1996, Richard Basile and his wife, Marietta, who were both retired real estate agents in their late 70s, were at home in their Brooklyn residence. A package came in the mail addressed to Marietta Basile. Richard, however, was the one who opened the package in her stead. It appeared to have been sent by the March of Dimes in New York and felt like an advertisement containing a videotape. When Richard opened it, it was indeed a videotape. However, it quickly exploded shattering a nearby kitchen window and causing damage to the wall. The mail carrier who had delivered the package only moments earlier heard the blast and rushed into the home. Both occupants had mercifully evaded the bullets. Upon examining the debris, they could see what looked like two barrels laying side by side inside the tape. Unbeknownst to them, they had been the next and final target of the zip gun bomber. Over a three-year period, the zip gun bomber had sent five explosive devices to five separate residences across New York. But in 1996, the spree came to an unexplained and sudden end. The identity of the elusive bomber remained unknown, but the police furiously hunted for the culprit. And eventually they would land on a plausible suspect. The hunt for the zip gun bomber resumes. After the second bomb had been sent to Anthony Lenza in 1993, investigators were able to link the design of the device to that of the one used to kill Joan Kipp in 1982. The subsequent devices also shared similar characteristics all involved bullets fired simultaneously towards the target's chest. The designs were rudimentary but required knowledge of electrical wiring, and all had been mailed in brown bags with legitimate-looking return addresses labeled on the paper. Greg Radigan, an investigator for the U.S. Postal Service, described how all of the packages had been designed to look like they were offering a gift and had eye-catching prints on the front to capture the target's attention. The bombs were most likely created by the same person, but they could not determine why the recipients had been targeted. The bombing seemed random, which caused a problem in determining the identity of the sender. The investigation into the bombings encompassed multiple agencies and was spearheaded by the postal inspector's office. They were able to determine that all of the people the packages had been addressed to had links to either civil or military service. Whether this was coincidental or not is unknown. Furthermore, they could find no real evidence linking the victims. Their selection seemed random and devoid of motive. Greg Radigan, the aforementioned U.S. Postal Service inspector, believed that the bomber was from out of town and had recently moved to New York and began causing havoc. Criminologist Harvey Kushner agreed with this position, adding that he believed the bomber was a loner who had few social connections and would not be likely to brag about his deeds to others. Evidence was lacking, but the police did come up with one working theory. They posited that the bombings may have been part of an extortion campaign 
with the bomber delivering the devices to remind their victims of their mortality if they refused to comply with their demands. Officers highlighted how many family members of those targeted were hesitant to speak with investigators, sometimes not communicating at all. But no proof for this theory could be found and it was eventually abandoned. The investigation into the zip gun bomber came to a standstill. The evidence was lacking, and no suspects could be identified. Investigating officers did confirm that they wanted to speak to Craig Kipp again, but this did not happen. Because, as it turned out, there was another plausible suspect about to emerge one with a curious connection to Joan Kipp. The curious case of Stephen Wavra. In 1983, a year after the murder of Joan Kipp, police officers working on an unrelated case were examining a property occupied by their unnamed target and his roommate, Stephen Wavra. Inside, they found bomb-making equipment on a kitchen table along with the hollowed-out book. Wavra, their target's roommate, claimed ownership of the equipment, adding that his roommate knew nothing of his intentions with the items. He claimed he was intent on using the equipment to create a device to use on a U.S. military base. But officers began to entertain another prospect, that Wavra may have been the man who created the bomb that killed Joan Kipp a year earlier. So who was Stephen Wavra? He served in the U.S. Navy from 1972 to 1973, a time during which he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. After leaving the Navy, his life took an untoward turn and his criminal record began to expand. At one point he was convicted of possessing caustic liquids, making bomb threats against postal facilities, and attacking a military police officer. On two other occasions, he had been caught making devices similar to those used by the zip gun bomber. There was a logical reason for officers to suggest he may have been the zip gun bomber himself, heightened by an interesting fact that soon emerged, Joan Kipp had been Stephen Wavra's guidance counselor at Diker Heights Junior High School. He had been held back twice during his time there, leading officers to believe he may have held resentment towards the school and its staff. Could this have indeed been the case? Stephen Wavra appeared to be the perfect suspect. But there was one major problem. He was incarcerated at the time of Joan Kipp's death. He had spent time in and out of jail in the years since he left the Navy, and officers confirmed Wavra was in prison in 1982. As a result, Wavra became less of a suspect as time went by, although some believed it was possible he may have had outside help who created and or delivered the bomb on his behalf. But with no evidence, his connection to the murder could not be established. In 1995, Stephen Wavra came back onto the scene as a suspect. He mailed a 250-page raving anti-government manifesto to several federal courthouses. When he was arrested, he was found in possession of a hollowed-out book that contained several knives. He was also found carrying 4.22 caliber rifle shells, in breach of his parole conditions. Wavra was rearrested as a result and sent back to jail. The task force investigating the bombings once again focused on Wavra and tried to connect him to the bombing spree that had terrorized residents of New York. They found nothing. However, officers did find a connection between Wavra's roommate and the bombing targets. When they looked at written records from the pharmacies the targets had visited, they found the roommate's name in all of them. This seemed to be the only linking factor investigators could find, but it was insufficient to determine direct involvement. Investigators were convinced the two were either involved or knew more information than they had divulged, but they were unable to formally name either as a suspect. Could they have indeed been involved after all? Closing with no further suspects identified and the bombing spree seemingly at an end, the investigation into the identity of the zip gun bomber gradually drew to an unofficial close. The bomber never made contact with either the police or the media, and their spree came to a sudden end in 1996 for unknown reasons. Investigators could also never determine what the true motivation behind the bombings was. As it stands today, a $100,000 reward is on offer for any information leading to the identification and capture of the zip gun bomber. Despite this, new leads are non-existent and the elusive killer's identity remains unknown. Just who was the bomber, and what led them to terrorize New York residents for so many years? Perhaps one day we will be able to know the answer to this question.